always terrible to hear yourself, actually. So I'm going to forget that. Um, uh, and uh, we'll be talking about um, brain dynamics and children under anesthesia. That uh, is a topic that's come up repeatedly um, during the discussion yesterday, also at um, a symposium I gave last night uh, uh, for the Society of uh, Anesthesiology of Chile. So, so, so I'll spend some time on that as well. So um, again, same disclosures uh, as last time. So. Um, so yesterday we talked about you know these EEG signatures of anesthesia, and in the afternoon session, Francisco uh, uh, talked a lot about um, the um, uh, physiology of these waves, um, looking at it um, uh, in recordings in uh, rodents, and in particular talking about the, the thalamocortical mechanisms that we think govern um, uh, this, uh, these um, uh, beta and alpha uh, dynamics, uh, and the notion of a, a kind of boot-up sequence that can occur uh, during emergence. So, so you've heard about these kind of higher frequency things. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, the, the lower frequency, you know, slow oscillation uh, delta band um, uh, activity and then compare, you know, what we see uh, there in uh, both anesthesia with propofol and uh, in uh, natural sleep. So um, I'll, I'll reference a lot um, data from this paper from 2012, Lewis et al., where um, we were able to record uh, intracranially uh, in um, patients who had come into uh, um, the hospital for epilepsy surgery. So they had to have um, electrodes implanted uh, to uh, figure out where their seizures were coming from. Um, and then, um, uh, um, so they, they have to stay in the um, epilepsy monitoring unit for uh, a week or two. And then after that, they come back to the operating room to have the electrodes removed. Um, at which point um, uh, we can actually uh, uh, hook up to the electrodes and record during the induction of uh, uh, And in many of the uh, uh, patients, they actually volunteer to have uh, these microelectrode arrays implanted as well, so we can actually record from those. Um, so we asked this, these subjects to um, uh, pr uh, participate in an um, uh, auditory task, much like the uh, EEG experiment where they heard uh, different sounds and pressed a button in response to sounds. So let's just take a look at some of the data in a little more detail. So one of the first things we saw is that, uh, indeed, um, um, the uh, slow oscillation power uh, uh, increases sort of abruptly right at the point where um, loss of consciousness occurs. So here are, are uh, uh, three patients that we studied with the neuroport arrays. Um, where we saw that kind of abrupt increase in slow oscillation power. These um, uh, recordings are performed on the uh, temporal cortex, and so uh, we don't see that frontal alpha, uh, which is you know primarily as as uh, Francisco showed, uh, we think uh, in the medial prefrontal cortex. So we just see the slow oscillation. We do see this kind of increase in beta uh, and, and gamma power, which um, um, uh, is also you know visible in EEG. So, so that's telling us, you know, kind of confirming, uh, if you will, the findings in the EEG that the slow oscillation power increases uh, right at the point of loss of consciousness. Then if we look at the, um, uh, how the neurons couple to uh, uh, the oscillations, we can see that, that um, there's um, uh, essentially phase-limited firing with kind of long periods of silence. So just uh, in terms of how this graph is set up, so this uh, dotted line is the point where the uh, this individual subject stopped responding, so we call that uh, the loss of consciousness point. Um, and then if we look at the neural firing prior to loss of consciousness, there's, there's you know, kind of lots of firing. And then, and then after that, if we kind of squint in, we can see that, that the neural firing is, is only happening you know, at particular phases of um, the, the slow oscillation. So, um, so uh, what we did here is we estimated the... Um, uh, if you will, a, uh, a histogram of firing as a function of the phase of the slow oscillation. So this is time in seconds, and uh, phase of the slow oscillation is here um, uh, on the uh, uh, on the, the y-axis. Uh, and what you can see is that the, the spikes are only happening essentially uh, at, at the, uh, in this case, um, uh, in this case, at the, the troughs of the slow oscillation. And that's just because we, 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 we're plotting this with the um, positive down. So it's actually the peak of the, of the slow oscillation. Um, so you can see that's, that's true uh, for the local field potentials uh, and then also for the ECOG. Um, so when we look um, across the cortex, if we take the slow oscillation, estimate its phase at different locations, um, what we see is that the very local ones have this um, uh, phase relationship. The grid electrodes, um, the clinical grid electrodes that are nearby also have this phase relationship. But then if you get further and further away, that phase relationship goes away. So this is like a grid electrode that's maybe about three centimeters or, or, or further away. Um, 
And, and so uh, uh, the way we think about this is that the, these um, low frequency or slow oscillations are, are, are kind of uh, out of phase and they're actually incoherent as you get further and further apart. So they start off, <laughs> move for, further and further apart, they kind of become uh, incoherent. Um, and then of course then the relationship at the distant electrodes, uh, uh, the, uh, the phase of the distant electrodes uh, 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 no longer has a relationship with um, the uh, neural firing at a distance. Um, so the way we interpreted then uh, uh, this data was that um, locally you have this tight coupling uh, between the firing and, and the uh, slow oscillations, uh, but then um, uh, and, and we could imagine that that coupling would be replicated at you know uh, many different locations. But uh, of course, the precise times when you had the upstates um, uh, at, at different points in, in uh, the cortex would sort of be misaligned in time. Um, so just as an example, at a given point in time indicated by this red line, you know, uh, at, at, at this location here, the, maybe the neurons could fire. But then at some other distant location, say over here, um, the, uh, um, uh, the neurons here might be in a, in a, uh, in a down state and, and might not be able to fire. So uh, the idea was that, that this slow oscillation dynamic with the lack of co coherence implied a sort of um, uh, um, fragmentation or disruption of processing uh, uh, um, amongst cortical areas. So as I mentioned yesterday, I alluded to this, we, we think that that's a really uh, um, strong fundamental evidence that when you see that slow os oscillation or anesthesia, that a patient would be, you know. Um, now, if you compare that to sleep, it's really interesting. Here's a, uh, uh, some data from uh, Near et al. Uh, in neurons. So this is from Julia Tononi's group. Um, doing very similar recordings, but during non-REM sleep. And what we see here is that um, there's a similar dynamic where you have this alternation between firing uh, in upstates and, and uh, silence in downstates. But if you will, the duty cycle is quite different. So with propofol, it's mostly silent with brief periods uh, uh, of firing. But in sleep, um, it's um, you know mostly firing with only brief periods of silence. Uh, and then if we look at at the the, the slow uh, wave here, so you know, uh, Tengo left and right, uh, um, I guess entorhinal cortex. We see that the, the 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 slow waves are really quite quite synchronized. You know, compared with propofol, like uh, across different cortical areas, that isn't the case. The slow oscillations are again out of phase and incoherent. So, so we see that you know in these two situations, um, they're they're really quite different uh, properties of the slow slow waves, uh, and um, we we think that this relates uh, ultimately to the the uh, reason why. Um, with propofol, you're 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 you know unlikely to be aroused to uh, consciousness by an external stimulus, whereas with sleep, obviously you can be aroused. The cortex is sort of still active and uh, capable of receiving an input, and 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 you're you're still uh, able to be awakened. With propofol, uh, there's such a uh, disruption because of these uh, properties that, that that maybe that can't happen. Um, okay, so actually I'm gonna skip over this. Um, maybe I'll just mention it briefly. So so. Um, <laughs> I, th I think this is actually, this is in, in a way like uh, a, uh, my PTSD to a reviewer's comment for that paper, and, 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 uh, but it, it's kind of worth mentioning. I mean, I think you, on Monday you had this um, a symposium really on signal processing, so it's just worth mentioning. So, so everyone kind of gives coherence like a bad name, you know, and it's because in a way maybe they don't understand it or, or um, um, uh, um, uh, because it's non-directional or something. I don't, I'm not really sure why. Um, uh, but I think you might have seen in the in the workshop that coherence is relatively easy to estimate. You can use the multi-taper methods to estimate it, so you can you know get very efficient estimates. And in addition, you can know precisely what the you know bandwidth or what 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 the uh, um, uh, the, the the leakage or the bias properties are. So you can really understand the properties you know using the multi-taper method. Uh, however, you know you often talk about people um, uh, uh, using this phase locking value, and in a way, this phase locking value is kind of more intuitive because you're, you're imagining that well, at every moment in time, you know I'm going to estimate um, uh, uh, the phase of one signal at a given frequency, and then I'm going to uh, take this uh, phase of the second signal, and I'm going to look at the phase difference. Okay. Then I'm going to take that phase difference across different epochs and I'm going to average it. And then so if, if the, the, the phase difference between these two signals is really consistent across these di different epochs, then something real is happening and I can trust it more. You know, it seems more intuitive. So, so um, 
uh, if we look look at that and we just say, okay, well, hey, this is an average, right? So the law of large numbers applies. So I can replace this this uh, average with an expectation. So now it's okay. This is an expectation of um, uh, this uh, a phase difference um, um, at a given frequency. So now theta one and theta two are, are, are truly like random variables um, as a function of frequency. So now let's take a look at the coherence. Okay. So um, so this is a, a definition for the coherence. So we're going to take the uh, um, uh, uh, magnitude of the um, uh, of the um, uh, cross spectrum at a given frequency, and then we're going to divide by the uh, square root of the product of the power at the frequency for one signal and the power of the um, uh, one frequency, uh, the other, sorry, the other signal at, at that same frequency. So that's the coherence. Now let's just rewrite this. So this um, cross spectral density is actually uh, equal to this. It's the um, um, uh, uh, expectation essentially of the Fourier transform of one uh, of the signals multiplied by the um, complex conjugate of the Fourier transform of the other signal. Um, and then similarly, the power spectrum is just this uh, expectation of the, uh, of the um, essentially magnitude squared of this uh, uh, first signal and also expectation of the magnitude squared of this other signal. Okay, so now let's continue. So now if we rewrite this signal in, in the complex form, okay, um, uh, uh, so we, we can say, uh, uh, we, we write x1 as the magnitude of um, uh, 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 x1 uh, times its phase and the magnitude of x2 times its phase, we get this thing. Uh, and then this, this guy stays the same. And so I think if you um, uh, apply the uh, Cauchy-Schwartz uh, inequality, then what you get back is that this is true. And it might actually be equal. I, I just didn't have time to actually work it all out. Uh, but the point is, it's very, very similar to the phase locking value. And in fact, in fact, actually, uh, um, you know, I, th I think if you played with this, you can. It, it's very noisy because making phase estimates from uh, from filtered signals is actually kind of difficult, right? You have to um, uh, you have to um, band pass filter on a narrow band. Um, you have to then uh, um, uh, estimate the phase on, um, uh, uh, from that, and it's quite difficult. Whereas, uh, uh, as I think you've seen from the workshop, uh, um, multi-taper estimates of the cross-spectrum, multi-taper estimates of the spectrum are actually quite good and efficient. So then estimating the coherence is also really, really you know, straightforward. So, so um, yeah, so this phase coherence, uh, 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 this phase synchrony thing is actually really just a poor version, I think, of the coherence. Um, um, and I guess this will come up because we're going to be talking about coherence, but I didn't want to, um, to miss this point that, that they're, you know, quite, quite similar. Okay, so one of the things we saw in this um, uh, 2013 paper was that um, even though the, the alpha oscillations during the unconscious state were quite coherent, interestingly, um, uh, the slow oscillations weren't coherent. And this is really funny because they have a lot of power. I mean, there's a lot of power in the slow band. Like, how is it that it that that across different channels, you know, um, uh, um, uh, in this multi-channel sense, that that the slow oscillations aren't coherent? So, so that's a little bit of a mystery. So, um, um, so 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 that's that's really really interesting. And and I think that points back to the the, the Lewis paper where we saw that that uh, again these slow oscillations on the on uh, intracortical recordings really have um, uh, are, are out of phase and, and out of synchrony. So, so it really points to the fact that that uh, even though the uh, EG slow oscillations have high power, the the the, the high power uh, across the scalp is really not coordinated as you get further and further apart. Just re-emphasizing that point. Now, if we look uh, think about sleep, um, uh, we know from work uh, uh, from uh, Massimini and Tononi that that uh, um, the slow waves in sleep are, are kind of more like traveling waves, right? So they, they originate um, uh, anteriorly and kind of tend to move posteriorly. And here's an example of, of, a, of a time series, you know, uh, from high density EG showing how as you go from, from uh, uh, anterior to posterior, there's this really kind of delay in the, in the peak of the uh, slow oscillation. And maybe this is, it takes about maybe 100 milliseconds or so for this to move uh, anterior to posterior. So what does that imply then about um, about the coherence of these waves? So let's just break that down then. Okay, so so if if we observe a signal at a given point, you know, say here, and then essentially it's this it's a traveling wave, wave right? So 
then we observe a, another signal y of t, which is just a time shifted version of, uh, of x, okay, right? So that, that's literally the definition for a traveling wave. Now let's take that into frequency domain, take the Fourier transform uh, of, of x of t, that's uh, uh, x of f, and then actually, because y of t, the signal here, is just a time shifted version of, uh, of x of t, then what that means is that the, the, the spectrum is the same except for this phase term, okay? That, that's literally out of the textbook. That's, that's how, how that works. This delay results in, in, a, in a phase term, okay? So now if we, do, if we then uh, um, apply the definition of, of the coherence and we plug in you know, um, x of t, y of t into that definition, then what we see is that they should be perfectly coherent. Um, of course, nature is not that, that, that perfect. There's noise here, so they're going to be highly coherent. So, so um, you know, without having done the analysis, I think we can infer that, that uh, or predict at least that in sleep, um, uh, the soul oscillations would be uh, coherent or more so than, than with purple ball. So it's something we're studying. We finally have some sleep data in the lab, and we're looking at that. But that's uh, um, at least a prediction that would, you know, follow very naturally from this notion of a traveling wave. Um, okay. Um, now here's another kind of look at the, this sleep versus anesthesia thing. So there's some forms of anesthesia, like this dexmedetomidine-induced sedation, that do really look like sleep. As I mentioned yesterday, um, dexmedetomidine is a uh, alpha-2 agonist that works uh, presynaptically to re reduce norepinephrine release, uh, and uh, which then allows uh, subcortical structures to be uh, inhibited by a disinhibited preoptic area. Uh, and uh, the dynamics, again, as we saw yesterday, look very much like uh, depending on the dose, either non-REM2 sleeps, so spindles and, and some uh, slow power uh, or, or slow waves. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned yesterday, you know, one of the key differences is that, that uh, the, the, the uh, slow oscillation power and the, the alpha power in propofol are much uh, greater by maybe a factor of uh, 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 fourfold in amplitude uh, compared to uh, dexmedetomidine. So we predict that something is going to be very, like this is very similar in sleep. We ha are starting to work on this, and uh, we'll have a, uh, hopefully a poster at SFN that, that goes through this in greater detail, comparing um, uh, propofol with dexmedetomidine and uh, uh, physiologic sleep. So stay tuned for that if you guys are going to Society for Neuroscience. Um, um, so finally, just to kind of wrap up this topic, I want to talk about cross-frequency coupling. It's something that I think we alluded to in the earlier uh, uh, presentation. So um, uh, um, as we, we, we saw these, these two, you know, really dominant frequencies during propofol-induced unconsciousness, we asked, well, is there a relationship maybe between um, the phase of the slow oscillation and the amplitude of this alpha oscillation? We certainly saw that with the neuronal firing, but we wanted to see if it was true in the EEG. So, you know... Uh, we, we kind of wondered, you know, is the alpha oscillation, you know, maybe bigger at the peak of this slow oscillation? And here we're plotting uh, for the EEG positive up, so so the peak of the slow oscillation sh sort of should res uh, reflect the the up state. Um, and um, uh, um, uh, or are we looking at, at the at the trough? Um, uh, sorry, or would we expect the um, the alpha oscillation to be highest at the at the trough of the slow oscillation? Um, so what we saw um, uh, in, in this uh, propofol volunteer study is actually both dynamics are possible and they occur uh, at, at different parts of the dose response curve. So uh, in one part, um, during the transition to unconsciousness, we see that the uh, uh, alpha power is highest at the trough of the uh, uh, slow oscillation. Uh, and then later at the deeper levels, uh, of propofol before the, the subjects went into burst suppression, uh, um, as some of them did, uh, we see the opposite dynamic where the uh, alpha is strongest at the peak of the slow oscillation. Uh, and just to show the time series, you can literally see this. Um, um, uh, in the raw trace here, you can kind of kind of see it. If we band pass filter, we see that the uh, alpha um, in this trough max phase here uh, is highest at uh, again, the troughs of, of the slow oscillation. And then later, uh, it tends to be higher uh, uh, at the peaks of, of the uh, slow oscillation, again, at the deeper levels. Uh, and, and just to mention it, like, uh, of course, all these oscillations are really dependent on the way you reference the scalp EG. So in this case, we were using a, a, a kind of a Laplacian uh, uh, reference. So essentially, um, we, we had sort of an absolute uh, frame of reference, you know, where, where essentially... Um, uh, um, uh, um, you know, tangential 
uh, underlying currents uh, 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 would, would uh, have an orientation where, where uh, I guess, uh, currents pointing out of the scalp would be uh, viewed as positive. Um, so there's no uh, so so there's no way that that this comes up as a as a kind of artifact of referencing. Um, okay, so then I, I guess one of our hypotheses is that that um, this this lighter stage of anesthesia is maybe more you know closer at, at least in the ability of the subject to be aroused to um, uh, physiologic sleep. So we're thinking that oh sorry I got ahead of myself needed more coffee. Um, so um, we we, we um, in 2014, actually, in J Neuroscience, we published this uh, uh, paper, um, Mukamel et al. Uh, sorry, this is a, uh, I forgot to update this, um, where we actually use source local localization to figure out kind of uh, uh, which um, uh, brain areas or networks might be uh, involved in this, um, uh, in this oscillation. And so what we found is that the trough max pattern was really, you know, uh, uh, focused uh, within this kind of um, medial prefrontal and anterior cingulate area, whereas the peak max pattern was sort of happening everywhere uh, um, across uh, ac across the uh, the cortex, uh, and this really, you know, I think corresponds with other data. So uh, certainly, this uh, corresponds nicely to the data that Francisco showed in the rodent, where we were, you know, uh, recording, you know, an equivalent location um, uh, within the rodent medial prefrontal cortex, and it's also consistent with. Um, uh, areas of the brain that have been um, uh, studied, say, by uh, um, uh, imaging methods, where uh, during emergence from consciousness, you know, these uh, uh, these areas, in particular anterior cingulate, sort of become active uh, during emergence, and so that that's consistent with the notion that this is something that this is an area that's active, a network that's active during the transitions uh, uh, to and from uh, unconsciousness, and the fact that this um, peak max pattern happens everywhere is certainly consistent with the notion that. Uh, the observations that we had in Lewis were where throughout this uh, intercortical grid, um, the slow oscillation was present. Um, okay, and then I guess the prediction we would make for sleep, again, because the trough max is sort of the lighter stage, that, 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 um, um, uh, that, the, that this maybe corresponds to uh, um, uh, phase amplitude coupling in sleep slow oscillation, so where, where spindles seem to aggregate um, uh, um, uh, during... Um, uh, during certain portions of the slow oscillation. So, um, so to wrap that up, then you know there are similarities in that both uh, propofol and and sleep uh, <coughs> correspond to um, uh, slow oscillations. You know the frequencies are, are quite consistent, and they both seem to have this uh, up down uh, um, or on off uh, dynamic uh, uh, where the neurons can fire and then be silenced. Um, there are differences in the, the duration of the uh, down or off states is more pronounced with propofol. Um, also, um, there is a, uh, a coherence or a, a, um, a synchrony relationship uh, spatially that's different. So with propofol, we see that the slow oscillations are everywhere and they're uh, asynchronous or incoherent, whereas the uh, um, slow oscillations with sleep, uh, 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 as a result of their being... Uh, uh, um, uh, Re reflecting a traveling wave are, are, are likely, you know, quite uh, coherent. Uh, and um, so, but maybe in general, we kind of view propofol induced slow oscillations as being kind of a different animal um, uh, than sleep. Um, so, uh, all right, so that, that kind of concludes that part of the talk. I wanted to switch gears briefly. Let me see how much time I have. Um, uh, so maybe about 20 more minutes. Yeah. So um, we talked uh, briefly yesterday about... Um, uh, EEG in children, you know, we, we ta saw um, um, uh, uh, really interesting data um, uh, about a child development uh, and consciousness later in the session. And, and so um, I, I, I thought it'd be interesting to mention the studies we've been doing with uh, uh, child development uh, and, and anesthesiology. Um, it also came up in the discussion we had yesterday at the Ch Ch Chilean Society of Anesthesiologists. Uh, as you know, um, uh, or may, as you may not know, actually, um, you know, a big question that uh, um, uh, a controversy that, that we're trying to figure out in anesthesiology right now is um, whether or not uh, and the extent to which uh, anesthetic exposure in children, you know, might be harmful uh, to their brains. So the um, controversy stems from the fact that in animal models, uh, uh, children who are exposed to anesthetics, uh, excuse me, in animal models, juvenile animals who are exposed to anesthetics, 
uh, um, have uh, um, show evidence of neurotoxicity after exposure with later uh, developmental and, and cognitive problems. Um, and then if you look at uh, uh, human studies, there are some studies, um, uh, smaller studies that focus on, on, on particular you know, measures such as um, memory function or learning disabilities that show like an effect uh, when children are exposed uh, early uh, in life. Uh, and then, and then other, you know, very large randomized controlled trials in Europe, as well as uh, randomized controlled trials in in America of of brief anesthetic exposure, show that there's kind of no effect. And and I think the general tendency for those larger uh, clinical studies is they 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 look kind of at a course level, like randomized test scores or or maybe Bailey scales, which are course measures of of um, of uh, uh, of uh, cognitive or motor function. So, so the question I have is, you know, is there something in between those levels of assessment? You know, is there something the anesthetic is doing at a circuits level that we can look at? Are there ways of measuring, you know, or thinking about how anesthetics might impact child development? So that's the next part of this talk. And I, I think you guys will find this interesting. So we, we saw yesterday this, this slide where, you know, you could see that, that um, the anesthesia-induced EEG has a similar form uh, throughout um, development and aging, but, but you know, the kind of quantitative details change. So we, we actually looked at this um, um, uh, progression in, um, in children in a lot of detail. We looked at it in adults, uh, in elderly adults, but we looked at it in children as well. And, and here's what we saw. So um, we characterized uh, in this paper, I kid you at all, um, um, the total power in the EG from about 0.5 hertz up to 40 hertz. And we just made a plot of it in these subjects who are receiving sevoflurane going from you know, a few months old through about, um, uh, say, 28 years of age. And so um, this, this total power is, of course, dominated by slow and alpha. So, we're, so, so really, slow and alpha power have you know, a very similar um, uh, 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 relationship. If we look at the form of the signal, we see you know, slow and alpha, slow and alpha, slow and alpha, uh, going from you know, late 20s all the way down into, um, uh, say, uh, um, uh, 10 years of age. We get down into this few months uh, age range, and we see, well, it doesn't really have the same form. So that's interesting. We'll come back to that. But, but looking at this curve, you know, it's clear that there's this increase in total power and in alpha power, for instance, early on, and then it plateaus, and then it comes back down. So initially, we thought, well, that, that, that probably relates to development, maybe synaptic development. And later, as we start to uh, study this a little more, um, we, um, we found evidence of this. So here's a paper. Um, from uh, 2011, uh, uh, Patanjik et al. Uh, uh, and I, uh, from uh, uh, um, uh, Pashko Rakish's lab and colleagues. Uh, and what you can see uh, here, if we're looking at, say, the uh, um, uh, synaptic buttons uh, at, at various uh, uh, points within the uh, uh, dendrites, we can see that, you know, at one month of age, there isn't a, 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 a there aren't a lot of uh, synaptic buttons. There seems to be a, a kind of a, an explosion here you know, uh, uh, just a, a year and a half later. Uh, and then fast forwarding maybe uh, 12 years, we see that, that there starts to be kind of this progressive uh, pruning of the synapses. Uh, and, and these are, um, uh, we're, we're, these uh, analyses were done in um, tissue samples, post-mortem samples from uh, human prefrontal cortex. So it's, you know, again, quite relevant to where we're actually making the, the EEG measurements. And you can see that, that you know, Similar to the, the EG data, we have this kind of peak that happens, you know, eight to ten years of age, and there's, there's kind of this progressive decline. So, so that, that's kind of encouraging that, that, um, uh, that our um, EG results are, are consistent with, with this uh, um, underlying neuroanatomy. And, and I guess one, one additional piece of information that we're, you know, seeing from the EG data is that, that this is the uh, power that, that, that uh, uh, arises from, you know, a specific GABAergic, you know, probe to the system. So in a way, we're seeing um, uh, uh, maybe the influence of the, the in, in particular, of the GABAergic uh, circuit uh, development. Um, th this, this notion that, that alpha power uh, um, might increase uh, with development is also, you know, borne out in, uh, say, in, in studies of uh, uh, childhood neglect. So this is data from... Uh, uh, Chuck Nelson's lab, Chuck Nelson from uh, Boston Children's Hospital, and his, uh, you know, of course, very famous Bucharest Early Intervention Project. Um, so he studied um, uh, different uh, uh, different children who are orphaned. Uh, he looked at them at, uh, in this case, at eight years of age. Um, uh, some of them had um, uh, never been in institutionalized, 
Uh, others were placed into foster care, you know, kind of later in life after they're about two years old. Others were introduced into foster care at an early age, less than two years of age. And then some uh, uh, children that were controls were, were you know, uh, um, not orphans. They were never institutionalized. So uh, what he saw is that the um, resting state uh, alpha waves, you know, had a significant difference. Uh, uh, compare, um, so basically, children who were either never institutionalized uh, or who had been introduced into foster care early had, you know, quite strong uh, uh, resting state alpha power, whereas those that uh, had been um, uh, institutionalized and, and, and never placed into foster care or had been placed into foster care late, they tended to have uh, lower alpha power. So, so the notion that, that this, uh, these circuits and alpha power is, is developing uh, through time is, I, I think, um, um, you know, quite, quite, quite interesting. Um, so uh, I wanted to uh, go back to this um, idea that these um, uh, um, frontal um, alpha waves we see in the humans and also in the rodents are, are highly coherent. Uh, and, and that coherence seems to um, come about uh, through some, some uh, um, um, thalamocortical coupling. Um, so we, we first uh, uh, saw evidence of this from simulation studies, um, computational modeling studies uh, with Nancy Capel. And then, of course, uh, you saw Francisco's evidence of this um, from uh, um, um, invasive recordings in rodents um, in both uh, uh, thalamus and medial prefrontal cortex. So, um, so this is a typical thing that we see in the adults. The co there's coherence frontally uh, within this alpha wave. So we look at children who are less than one year, year of age. We see, um, uh, first of all, that uh, for children that are, you know, say four to six months of age, they actually don't have a frontal alpha predominance. It, the alpha is just kind of everywhere, and it's just it's not coherent. Um, uh, and then when we look at um, uh, the frontal coherence um, uh, um, from um, uh, from clinical recordings, which is the frontal EEG, we see that that uh, uh, coherence develops at approximately one year of age. So we've seen this with sevoflurane, and then also uh, uh, in, in another paper that's actually just been accepted to anesthesiology that will be coming out uh, later this year uh, with propofol. Uh, and this is work uh, 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 for this uh, very young children that we've done with uh, Chuck Birdie and Laura Cornelson at uh, uh, Boston Children's Hospital. So, so our inference is then that that you know, what might be happening is we might be seeing sort of a readout of the development of, of um, you know, uh, uh, functional capabilities in this uh, thalamocortical circuit. Um, and there's evidence of this, at least from the uh, fMRI world. So neonates uh, who are um, placed in an uh, um, MRI scanner who uh, uh, um, uh, 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 who undergo resting state fMRI and, and uh, who... Uh, um, uh, for, for which uh, uh, functional uh, connectivity maps can be derived, uh, they um, uh, show, you know, uh, strong like uh, thalamocortical functional connectivity with the uh, um, uh, motor and somatosensory cortex, but uh, the, the thalamus doesn't have uh, uh, strong connections to, um, uh, say, this uh, uh, medial prefrontal uh, network. Uh, fast forward a year, and you see that uh, that uh, thalamocortical um, Frontal connectivity develops, and it you know remains at, at two years of age, and and you know presumably onward into adulthood. So so that's at least some other evidence in humans that that um, that uh, um, frontal thalamocortical um, uh, functional connectivity is is developing somewhere in this uh, uh, first year of life. Um, so I want to come back to this uh, uh, this curve. Um, so 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 it's interesting. Like I, I think. Uh, this, this question of um, uh, anesthetic um, influence on the developing brain, you know, is is, is really um, uh, a uh, um, important one, and and really, I guess anesthesiologists have, have have thought of this primarily as a neurotoxicity question, and not so much as a neurodevelopment question. So, um, as we were just getting into this re research, you know, I, I of course was you know quite um, ignorant about about um, you know the neurobiology of development. So it was interesting. Um, I was um, on a plane coming back from Society for Neuroscience, and uh, and actually I spent the whole meeting uh, um, uh, talking to people at NIH trying to find out how to get different uh, you know, research projects funded. So I didn't actually do a lot of science. Um, so I was a little frustrated, and I you know I kind of uh, sat down on the plane and 
I uh, was a little disappointed, not only with uh, the fact that I didn't get to go to many posters, but because, you know, obviously these conversations with program officials can be pretty frustrating. So I sat down there and, you know, in walk all these people, you know, going back to Boston, poster tubes in hand, and, and someone sit next, sits next to me. So so um, so we started talking about science, and I was like, oh, yeah, so we, we started analyzing this in uh, in in children, we don't know what it means, and and I showed this curve, and it, it turned out that this person was um, a developmental neurobiologist, actually a a postdoc uh, in uh, uh, Takao Hench's lab uh, uh, at Harvard and 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 a Children's Hospital, and of course, you know, Takao Hench is uh, 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 one of the leading figures in studying the uh, neurobiology of critical periods, and she was like. Oh well, that looks like you know these curves of, of critical period plasticity that we you know uh, um, 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 study in our lab. And I was like, oh, what 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 is critical period plasticity? So of course I got to reading about that, and and um, it turns out that it's totally fundamental to you know uh, brain development, um, and um, um, uh, and it's essentially the 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 mechanism by which um, you know children have this incredible ability to learn um, you know new um, uh, um, sensory uh, discrimination skills, uh, motor skills, language skills at particular points in time and set up in a sequence that, that kind of builds upon itself um, uh, so that, that, again, children can rapidly learn uh, and acquire information. It's the reason that, you know, children can, can pick up languages and uh, uh, very readily the way that the reason they, of course, can, you know, become very skilled at, at uh, playing musical instruments, whereas adults, you know, uh, trying these things later in life have a much harder time. Um, and, uh, and the earliest example of this was maybe imprinting, where uh, if uh, uh, um, uh, baby geese are uh, exposed to uh, uh, um, a, a, a human being instead of their mother, say in the first 24 to 48 hours of life, they will uh, um, imprint on the human and follow the human around instead of their mother. Um, and again, that, that, that's a, a, a transient window that happens you know, at a particular point in time. And um, so uh, um, I guess the, the scary thing is that these, these windows are, 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 are transient. They happen at a particular point in time. And so if we were to um, disrupt them in some way, you know, we, we might be concerned that we well, uh, could uh, seriously affect uh, downstream development. So uh, the question comes up, then what kind of affects the, uh, what regulates the timing of these critical periods? And, you know, it, it took a little bit while for this to sink in, but it's, it's kind of scary. It's actually GABAergic or inhibitory signaling. More generally, it's of course excitatory and inhibitory balance, but but you know the initial evidence was really focused on on GABAergic uh, inhibitory signaling. So one of the seminal um, um, uh, uh, experiments or studies in this by uh, Fagiolini and, and Hanch was uh, uh, showed that essentially uh, in uh, GAD65 knockouts, right, that don't have a visual critical period, or in in dark reared mice that uh, whose critical period has been delayed, so they never have this, a visual critical period. You can restore the critical period by giving uh, infusions of diazepam, a benzodiazepine, uh, uh, not unlike the benzodiazepines that we use um, uh, uh, clinically, uh, especially for children, uh, and, and not, of course, unlike you know a propofol or sevoflurane, which act uh, um, as a GABA agonist. So, so the natural and obvious thing is to then worry. Well, maybe by giving these GABAergic drugs to children, we could be uh, especially very young ones, we could be perturbing uh, critical periods. Uh, um, this kind of idea isn't on anyone's radar in anesthesiology, unfortunately. Uh, we, uh, I, I was just uh, at this anesthesiology conference a week ago, and and we presented this idea, you know, myself and to Cal Hench, and uh, um, uh, and I, I think the audience was shocked. They didn't. Un, um, uh, um, uh, that, is that the hand raise for 40 or for 50? 45, sounds good. I'm almost done. Um, so, um, uh, but it's truly, a, a, you know, a fundamental mechanism that we have to uh, uh, look at. Um, so, so again, the anesthetics seem to be operating at kind of a similar side of action as, uh, you know, the primary drivers of uh, the onset of these critical periods. Um, and so the question we're trying to refocus uh, um, anesthesiology onto is not so much onto neurotoxicity, but, but really a question of neurodevelopment. You know, how, does, how, how might anesthetic drugs influence uh, you know, the trajectory of development? Uh, and it seems we're acting at this locus that really is uh, crucial and fundamental. So our, our thought process that is that um, you know, anesthetics could actually negatively impact um, um, 
the, the uh, trajectory of these critical periods uh, if they're given uh, at the wrong point in time and at uh, 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 levels of exposure that are too high. Um, on the other hand, if we were able to figure out, you know, levels of exposure that didn't uh, affect the critical periods, then we could actually have a neurobiologically rigorous definition for a safe anesthetic. And moreover, if we know that the um, mechanism that's driving this is sort of GABAergic signaling, there are ways to circumvent that. There are other drugs we can give. There are actually combinations of drugs that we can give to kind of counteract that GABAergic effect. And, and we just need to understand this a little bit more uh, um, to have a rationale to put in uh, into play these other uh, clinical strategies. Um, so actually, I'm going to stop there. Um, um, so, um, so yes, I'll, I'll stop there and, and uh, uh, take some questions now. Thank you. Giving a mix a mix of drugs where you you know first give anesthetics and then give diazepam to the oh sorry could you repeat that just that last bit sorry sorry so um, w when you were re when you were reviewing the idea that maybe anesth anesthetics may affect the neurodevelopment um, which I think is a fascinating hypothesis it was also thinking you also showed evidence that you can give diazepam to restore the critical periods right so could one think of giving anesthetics in combination with diazepam afterwards to, you know, counteract the negative effect that the anesthetics may, may cause in kids. Oh, oh, no, no, no. So actually, you know, the diazepam actually acts through the same mechanism of, of the anesthetic. So the diazepam is actually an anesthetic. So it's a benzodiazepine that acts a GABA A. It's a GABA, powerful GABA A agonist. So it's, it's okay. totally equivalent to, like, midazolam. Um, and okay. it, it's very similar uh, uh, um, uh, in mechanism of action to, like, propofol or sevoflurane, actually. Okay. So, so in, in fact, uh, so, so the inference is that... that um, um, uh, so, so yeah, you, you couldn't give those in combination. In fact, you would exacerbate the problem in that instance. I see. But, yeah. but isn't there evidence that um, antidepressants do, do antidepressants, like, you know, um, I think that, yeah, I think antidepressants, don't they open up critical periods? Uh, yes, they can too. So, you, are so, you, yeah. so I'm, I'm kind of like hinting at, you know, could you give some kind of drug to counteract the effect of the anesthetic. Yes, I think we can. Yeah. So, so if 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 the uh, uh, um, uh, and I guess actually to turn it around, like if you were uh, in a, a another situation where the critical period wasn't opening, where therapeutically you wanted to open it, right. for instance, you could you could give the anesthetics or a um, or a sedative like a midazolam or diazepam to to act therapeutically too, right? right? So, but I'm I'm actually thinking of the, the situation where in a otherwise healthy child that's you know, set to have their critical periods open at the appropriate times that we might shift it early and in a way throw off the sequencing. That's kind of the worry. Um, and uh, so, but yeah, going back to your question, how could you block it, right? So if it's GABAergic signaling that's, that's driving it, so there, there'd be two, two ways that I could think of immediately. One is you could use, you know, a multimodal anesthetic approach that focuses on pain management that doesn't use, uh, that uses very little GABAergic drug, A, so that's one way. Another way would be just avoid the GABA drugs altogether. There are people that are, are looking at alternative regimens using dexmedetomidine and opioids, which don't get into that. Um, and and they, they would affect the excitatory inhibitory balance, but I would think, you know, less profoundly. Uh, something we'd have to test, but readily testable in animal models. Readily testable, I think. Uh, and then another strategy, uh, 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 more to your point, would be that if if you're worried about the GABA ergic interneurons, you know, sort of, uh, um, overdriving inhibition, you could maybe block them uh, with ketamine. Right. Um, so, so those would all be alternatives that you could uh, 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 try out. And again, it's readily testable in animal models, and it's something then that you could kind of scale up uh, for for pediatric use. In fact, any of those combinations clinically are are, are pretty reasonable. I mean, um, uh, totally reasonable. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh. Uh, you talk about a slow oscillation that was coupled with uh, with spikes. Are these slow oscillations related with any biological or physiological process like burst rate or 
or something else. Oh, sorry, could you repeat the last part of that? Sorry. Is this slow oscillation related or coupled with any biological or physiological process like respiration, breath, or any other? I, you know, I, I don't think so. I, 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 well, I'm not really sure, actually. I think it's a great question. Like, maybe, maybe you know, it, it could be. We haven't studied that, yeah. yeah. Two questions. Basically, yeah, we, since kids seems to work differently, at least young, young, very young kids, we should, do you have an idea of what, how to monitor their brain? Because you show us yesterday that at least for that we are kind of in a pretty good uh, advance. But with kids, uh, do you have any idea what to monitor? Because alpha shouldn't shouldn't be our, our concern in in very young kids. That's one. And two, transition from uh, consciousness or or from consciousness to loss of consciousness seems to happen very fast. At least in that tr transition in phase with alpha and slow, when we're there in the trough and quickly there on the on the peak, what is driving this? It's like a switch, you know. It's at some point it's functioning that way. Somebody push push a switch, and then it's it's working the other way around. Do you have an idea what is that switch? I remember some of, of steriale. Neurons in the in the thalamus that switch from from uh, phasic to tonic very quickly, and if I don't remember bad, they tend to uh, be important in, in in sleep generating. You know, do you have a, a mechanism of that switch transition? Yeah, so I, I can get into that. So so for the first part of your question, um, you know, what do you do in the very young children? So uh, I, I I didn't show. Uh, um, uh, data for this, but I think you can infer it um, from just looking at the w what I did show. Uh, in the uh, Cornelison paper, um, we, we showed that in the, the first few months of life that um, uh, the alpha and beta power are just starting to kind of increase. And, and around, around you know, maybe four to six months, you start to see it, but then, it, of course, it only becomes coherent later. Um, so for the children, maybe as young as, as uh, um, you know, six months or around there, you could probably still use the same strategy. Like you'll still see this kind of alpha beta haze. Um, uh, but I think for the, the even younger ones, all they seem to have is a slow oscillation. So we just have to have better, you know, we, we'd have to look at that. And I think from a technical perspective, it's a little hard to pick up because, you know, at baseline, because they're moving and things like that, there are artifacts that look like that. And and so we'll have to figure out ways of of, of getting a cleaner signal so you can really see that um, transition into the slow oscillation for the really little kids, uh, and, but it also implies that if, if you know, a lot of the wiring isn't there, that maybe we don't need to to um, give drugs to, um, you know, maybe we can give le few, less hypnotic drugs for those children. Yeah. Um, okay. So then to the question about the the, the kind of sw switch in phase. Yeah. So in the in the data from the the Purdue 2013 paper, we we showed you know kind of on average across the population this kind of abrupt transition. When you look at individual patients, you, we often see this kind of actual middle ground where there isn't a really a clear uh, uh, phase amplitude relationship and then only becomes clear later um, uh, um, at, at the higher doses. So that, that's an interesting kind of you know, observation. Um, but our, our idea for the mechanism for this is that, that you know, uh, and this is a paper that we're about to submit. I think there's a Society for Neuroscience also abstract that, that, that'll be presented um, um, uh, this year. Um, and this is work with um, uh, Nancy Capel's group again, where what we think is happening is that, that there's a kind of an increasing, with, with increasing uh, uh, doses of the drug, there's kind of an uh, increasing hyperpolarization in thalamus that, that in one instance, you know, the the kind of alternation up and down and up and down, you know, uh, uh, on the up upswing, you know, uh, uh, allows the the uh, sorry, an initial uh, um, initially the hyperpolarization is such that the up and down uh, swings um, uh, kind of place the slow oscillation into some range where the alpha uh, um, oscillations are, are are favored. But then as the overall level of of uh, hyperbolization increases, we get into some other regime. It sort of 
gets into some other regime where, where now the alpha is, is, happens only at the peak of the uh, solar oscillation. That's the, kind of the basic gist of it. So we'll we have more details to follow in this, in this paper, but that's the, the basic idea. Yeah, it's kind of an increasing hyperpolarization relative to a particular range where the alpha can happen. Um, my question is about the first part of the talk, uh, when you find, um, are trying to find similarities between sleep and the pro protofoil. I was just wondering um, if, you, if you could comment on, on the fact that there is one big difference, which is the coexistence between alpha and, low oscillation, and slow oscillation that we don't see in sleep. That's right, yeah. So I wonder, I mean, if... That is that should be acknowledged as the fundamental difference. Right. No, I think that's a great point, and 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 I think that goes back to the fact that you know th this whole um, you know anesthesia induced effect is is you know uh, effect of GABA um, agonist action all through the brain, right? And that has a particular effect on that um, frontal thalamal cortical system. So I think that's a great comment. Yeah, I, I agree with that completely. Uh, hi. Uh, the, the FDA warning on all anesthetics is uh, for children under three years of age and being exposed to anesthesia over three hours long. So do you have any comment on those numbers? Why three hours? Why three years old? Because maybe the critical period is you know, over. Maybe there are some way ahead. So. Yeah, that is a great question. I, I, I mean, um, how did they come out with those numbers? Well, well. So first of all, that whole conversation again is is rooted in in the um, kind of neurotoxicity framework, right? So they didn't, they weren't thinking about critical periods or actually processes of development. For, first of all, and then I, and then the second part is I have no idea how they came up with those numbers. I, you know, I, I thinking of the clinical studies like there's the, you know, the paper from uh, from. Andres Lopke's group that studied, you know, four-year-olds and under, showing that there was a, uh, a disruption of, of like, uh, 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 you know, language acquisition and changes in, in auditory, you know, um, cortical thickness, you know, um, but that's four-year-olds and under. Um, uh, there's a, uh, um, a paper from Stratman et al. where they looked at ch children who were maybe exposed at two years of age. Uh, and and uh, under and that later had like deficits in rec recognition memory when they were maybe six years of age. So so yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe they should the average of those two. I'm not really sure. Yeah, and, and how you get get from the animal studies to three years? I don't know. I think they they probably it was probably just guesswork of some some sort. Yeah, I don't know if there's a fundamental reason why those numbers would have been chosen. Thank you. Um, just was. Uh, just uh, one question that, what do you think the alpha oscillation is relevant for loss of consciousness, loss of consciousness, or just is useful for monitoring? Because slow oscillation is important, in my view, the, for loss of consciousness, but alpha represents uh, a neural circuit, but I don't know if it's relevant for unconsciousness. Yeah. I don't know. What do you think? So, so I, I think it, it is relevant in the extent, to the extent that it's happening and it's functionally disrupting the circuit. And, and certainly prior to the, the, the deep level of, of unconsciousness, it, it's certainly, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, I guess the, the probably the primary reason you know the the um, sedative uh, uh, state occurs you know before the slow oscillation really kicks in, uh, but is it necessary? Do we need it? You know probably not. So if we could invent an anesthetic that had that produces a really strong slow oscillation but didn't have that uh, uh, frontal alpha, that would you know that would probably work and it might be better because we would just be you know um, uh, doing less to the brain in some sense. So so yeah, it's probably not necessary actually.